Hello, and welcome to this week's episode of The Pickleball Crew. We are a group of pickleball fanatics based in southeast Louisiana and are passionate about all things pickleball everywhere. Our focus is to inform, acknowledge those who help build the game regionally, and promote tournaments in our area. We do our best to present this with a love of the sport, a sense of humor, and a lot of fun. So join Vicki Wynn, Ken Wynn, Jeff Fuchsia, and me, Bud Klein, in our latest episode. We are glad you are along for the ride. Welcome to the 43rd podcast of the Pickleball Crew. We've talked a little bit about MLP in the past, but tonight we're going to jump in and talk a whole lot more and answer the questions, what is MLP? Yeah, thanks, Bud. We're all going to kind of speak at at first, kind of sharing um, what is an MLP tournament. I think technically it stands for Major League Pickleball, and it was a format that was created um, at some point to have teams play against each other. Now, in a more traditional MLP, you'll have teams of four players. You could actually have extra players that would substitute in, but mainly you would have two men, two women. So that means you would play one men's doubles, a women's doubles, and then two mixed doubles against your opponent, whether it be a round robin or a, a more of a, a bracket, you know, your normal bracket tournament with a, have a double loss elimination. But you're, you're really playing two men, two women, um, and it is a rally scoring. Jeff, why don't you tell us a little bit more about how the rally scoring works? Okay. So um, the rally scoring thing, uh, first of all, you decide what side you're going to play on, right or left, and you are locked in that position unless there's a timeout um, or an in change. You can switch positions. Other than that, you stay on one side or the other. Then it, it goes to rally scoring, meaning that a point mm-hmm. is scored every time the ball is served. So um, it, it's not like a traditional pickleball game where you have to be serving to score. If I serve into the net, that's a point for the other team. And And when you win a point on a serve, the same person doesn't continue to serve. The ball moves to the person, to your partner, and they now serve from their position. Yeah. So if it's an even score, you serve on the right. If it's an odd score, you serve on the left. Well, so you're going to play the four matches, right? A men's, a women's, two mixed. That's four. That's an even number. If the two teams tie two to two, then what happens? Okay, so if you end in a 2-2 tie, you go to what's called a dream breaker, which is where the teams will match up in an order against each other, um, and they'll play four points of, of, of four points of single points, and then they'll switch out. So for those of you that hear anything about singles, don't, don't feel like you got to play a full singles match. It's nothing like that. The dream breakers are a lot of fun. You're going to see some some fun different matchups. At one point, we saw Vicky against uh, Phil. Um, what's Phil? Harrington. Name? Phil Harrington, Harrington. Mm-hmm. from Mississippi. Um, but you only play four points, and then you rotate off, and then the next two rotate on, and you play rally scoring to fifteen or sixteen or twenty-one, whatever it is you're doing. So right. It's a different format, but it is a it is a lot of fun. There's a lot of strategy that's involved there. Um, I, I think all of us that have played in it so far, surprisingly for me, the first time it was it was a lot of fun. Um, I played. It so it, so the the other thing that happens too is whether you're playing to fifteen or twenty one, and and in this case it was to fifteen. I think win by two, if I'm not mistaken. And then if it was the dream break, or no, it was the finals, you made it to the finals, then you went to 21. But you lock out or freeze, they call it, at 14. Um, 14. Yeah, so explain what freezing means with your score, Vic. So freezing means basically you'll stay at 14 until 
either the other team makes it to 14 as well, and then it goes back to regular um, rally scoring, but you can only win your match if you are serving. So if you get the ball and you've got 14 and you serve it and you guys lose the, the point, then it goes back to the other side to gain more points. You can all, and if they then lose, lose the point, you don't gain another point. You have to then serve again and try to win that match on your serve. So it freezes out at 14. Yeah. I'll tell you, I'll tell you what it, what it, what I've seen, what it does. Because there's a point board on every single serve, it really puts a, a big emphasis on playing consistent pickleball. Yep. You don't want to you don't want to miss a serve. You don't want to miss a return. All of those things can really cost you. Whereas in a regular game, you might try to you know drill a serve down the line or something like that, be a little more risky. And I think. When, when you go back to regular scoring in a regular tournament, we always talk about consistency. So I, I think it I think it helps people's games um, in regular pickleball overall because of this format. I, I agree. You have to reduce those unforced errors. There's just no way around it. You have to do it. It's so easy to all of a sudden be staring at a score that's 7-0. I mean, it just happens that fast. Uh, you can blink and all of a sudden you're down seven points. It's like, <laughs> so right. So you have to reduce those unforced errors. Well, and we were, we were talking about it today at drills. A lot of people videotape yourself. You don't realize, a lot of people don't realize how many unforced errors they have. You videotape yourself and then, and then do like Bud's analytics and, and keep track of all four players on the court. I think some people might be shocked at how many unforced errors they have. Hey, Jeff, mm -hmm. I have yet to do an anal analytic on a, on a game where winners outscored unforced errors. Almost all points are scored, or the majority of points are almost always by unforced errors. That's that's correct. And I wonder, I wonder that ratio as you move up in level – um, we talk about this a lot. If you watch high-level pickleball, most points are scored by somebody forcing, either forcing a, um, a winner, um, I don't know what that would be called, or just an outright winner. I think at, yeah. lower, levels, at lower levels, you probably see a lot more unforced there. Absolutely. But this, I, I was going to ask a question on the Dream Breaker, just, just throwing this out there. Has there been any talk or have you heard of anybody – using many singles in the dream breaker as opposed to regular singles? No, it's, it's, okay. but you hop out there. I was worried about that. The first one I played in, it was really hot, um, real hot that day. But, and we had a couple of dream breakers we went to, but you jump out there and four points goes by I'm quick. Yeah. I've real played the dream breaker before. It's not that bad. Not at all. Not at all. Yeah. So, Again, nobody be don't if, if that's what is stopping some of you from getting in some of these, don't no. let them no, not so at all. Let's yeah, so let's mention one more one more aspect of the MLP. Now, at the real highest level of MLP professionals, those teams are, are formed, people are recruited for the teams. Most of the MLP tournament is a draft where they pick if there's 10 teams, there's 10 captains and they go kind of in a um, uh, it's it, I don't think it's a snake draft or maybe it is a snake draft where, you know, team one drafts down to team eight, then team eight drafts again and you work your way back to one. But then you fill your roster of four players. It'd be two men and two women based based on a draft. Um and we're going to get we're going to touch on that a little bit more as we get further into it. Any other any other thoughts, guys, just on general um, an MLP type tournament? Um, just that there's a, the um, element of a home and an away team, and that one team. Good point. Yeah, uh, has to reveal their lineup before you even get started, and so that gives your opponent a chance to try to use some strategy 
um, and who they play where um, mm -hmm. to try to win as many That's matches as they can. And it's it's interesting to watch that because sometimes people will even uh, purposefully lose a match. Like if they think that they don't have enough to uh, win all of them, they'll stack the deck with uh, certain matches and then let the other ones go. And if they get a win, great. If they, they don't, they don't. And it, and it ends up not, you know, making a difference as much. And that so. same strategy comes into play when you do the dream breaker. Yeah. That's so, right. because, you know, so it actually flips. So the team that has to show their hand in the first four matches, the other team then has to show their hand first in the dream breaker. So, so the key here is that you get to a minimum of a 2-2 two -two tie, right? And you want to make sure you win at least two, especially if you think you've drafted a team that are good singles players and dream breaker becomes, you know, your advantage. So yeah. those are good thoughts. Yeah. Okay. That's so correct. that makes a big difference in how you draft as well. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about, just last weekend, we played in a local MLP tournament, and we'll talk about some of the difference between a more traditional MLP tournament and the one we played in. It was in Hattiesburg at Tatum Park, which is a very nice uh, park. It's on the smaller side, but it is a nice park. And there must have been four, six, probably 10, 12 tennis courts there. And they were putting two pickleball courts on each tennis court so it was temporary lines with temporary nets but it was a nice complex um there was a pavilion in the center with offices and restrooms and it, it was well laid out um any other thoughts there vic um no just that there's some also some you know sidewalk and grassy areas that you can kind of stay off to the side mm -hmm. a little bit and um you know don't feel like you have to stack chairs and hover inside the courts anywhere so it's it's very you're right it's well laid out and um we had a slightly so, windy day um but it was a nice day a beautiful day mm -hmm. so what made this mlp more of a hybrid mlp is and we we see this happen um a little more frequently is you have a more, especially at the 4.0 plus versus the under 4.0 MLPs, and this was a 4.0 plus, you have, you end up with more men than women. So you can't, you can't draft mm -hmm. two men and two women for each team. This particular one had enough women to have one woman, and it was mandatory that one woman um, was at a minimum on each team. And we ended up with the numbers were so that one team had two females and two males. Every other team had a single female and three males. So a little bit different. Um, and the, but the captains were picked as the 10. It was actually 11 teams, the 11 highest players with their duper rating and two or three of the captains were females. So mm -hmm. by the, then they just drafted, well, I guess they could have drafted a female, but they drafted all men on their team as being a female captain. Yeah, that's right. I mean, and that, and that just brings up to the, the discussion that then when mixed doubles happens, um, particularly on when you only have one woman, it's, it is going to stay the same lady plays two mixed matches, matches mm -hmm. but you do have to play with a different man each time. You cannot repeat the same gentleman playing both times. Right. And 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 the female always played mixed, obviously, and she always had to play against the mixed team from their opponent. So you always had mixed against mixed. Um, again, with the exception of the team that had two females, um, you know, you had a mix going against uh, two, two men in that particular scenario. Was the the pro, was it cash prizes? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that's so part something of the that's pretty common with the with this new MLP format. And instead of medals, it's it's usually a a cash award for the first, second, third teams. And that's a great point, Bud, because that's kind of the lure. You know, we all if we've been playing pickleball for a few years, we all have, you know, some number of of medals in our drawer somewhere. 
And that's the lore that you're able to get onto a team with some really good players and the chance of, of winning not only your money back, but doubling your entry fee. Uh, so, yeah, that was the same way. I think the first three place teams cashed out. Um, Vicky yeah, I'm and not I, sure. I know neither, you did we were on separate well. teams. Yeah, we were on separate teams and neither one of us placed in the top three. So he did medals as well. So I don't know if he did a combo of money and and medals or one versus the other. I'm not real sure, but I I know he had some some medals out there as well. Well, Vicky, yeah, you played in a couple of these, haven't you? We now this was our second one. Our second one. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, Ken, you, you reminded me of something that, that's, that, that's exciting or should be exciting to people that are going to play in these. If we all go fan out and play in a regular pickleball tournament, um, you know, I may be playing in 4-5. Um, Vicki, you may be playing in 4-0 ladies. This MLP gives the opportunity for, um, which it was 4-0 and above, for for players to get on the court with some some four five and five oh players that you wouldn't have an opportunity to do that in a regular tournament not only to play with them but to play against a, a, a five oh player which which to me um you know that that affords a, a a different experience because everybody loves to play up and level with good players you, you get a really good player beside you you feel pretty pretty good you know so that that aspect of it, I think, is um, one of the big benefits, and and one why people should should go and try this out. Yeah, I I agree. I think it it was um you know there were a few guys that I went up against that you know you could very easily be completely intimidated and survive even. <laughs> I'm a short lady in case those who out there who don't know. And so when you're going up against some guys that are a little younger and over six feet tall, it can be a little intimidating, but at the same time, it's exciting. Um, It is a challenge and, um, and just really, really interesting to see how it all works and, and, and what type of strategy people are going to be using. And um you know, with the with the rally scoring, it can sometimes, you know, balance things out as well. So um, you just go out there, you have a good time, you learn um, so much by just participating in it. And it's such a great environment because it's a, it is a team sport, a team environment. And so everybody's very supportive of each other. Um, you, you'll figure out after a couple of matches who pairs up a little nicer than, than, you know, you might have one, one guy who pairs up really beautifully with the guy, but he didn't do as well with the lady. So it's, you know, it, it is a matter of these captains um, really having to work it and, and think about it. And, and I know for the most part, both times that I've participated, the captains are, are definitely open for suggestions and, and open for everybody's feedback. So it really does become a team effort and it's, um, it's it's a lot a lot of fun. I I've, I've enjoyed it. One of the things I think Marlana told me about them too is is you can do a pretty good eight team uh, MLP tournament on like a Friday night. You mm-hmm. don't have to have, you don't have to devote a whole weekend to it. Certainly you can do it you know on a Saturday or Sunday get it get it all done. Well, what was nice about this MLP versus our first one? The first one was a double loss elimination and um this one was a round robin so Mm -hmm. there were 11 teams vicky's team was in a bracket of five so she played four matches i was in the bracket of six so i played five matches um and there was a morning session under 4-0 and and we didn't start until 2 30 3 o'clock and we left at uh almost eight o'clock and the finals, this, they were just starting the semifinals. So I think they mm. probably went until 9 PM. So doing a round Robin, it lasted a little bit longer, but, but two observations. One is in this tournament, we had two or three five O players 
and another three or four players that were between 4.5 and 5.0. So there were a lot of good players that you either were fortunate enough to partner with or in our, my case, our team's case, play against. Um, it's fun playing against people at that level. And my second comment, piggybacking on what Vicky said, is that, you know, we had, I knew two of my teammates, but the female, I had never played with or against her. So you, we quickly had to try to figure out who was the best partner to put. And we, we made one decision of her playing with somebody, and we ended up halfway through our matches switching who she played with. Um, and it, it kind of worked out better for us. So um, those are the decisions you got to try to make on the fly because, bam, mm -hmm. you're into your first match, you know. That's very true. And um, it, it is. It's wriggling through all those little changes and things and understanding who's having a good day, who's maybe not – who your opponents are, how they're setting up. It's, it's, it's a lot to think about. And, um, and you're, you're just tweaking things as you go. And um, that makes it, I think even more exciting because it's just mm. constant thought and changes and strategy and just adds such a fun element to it. It, it really does. Honestly, I mean, all, all of what y'all are talking about there, there is so much strategy in pickleball. And, and I think, making us think like Ken, you, you said, trying to figure out who does who that's all stuff that helps us in a regular tournament, because you got to be able to, the, the teams that can figure stuff out on the fly, you know, like figuring out weaknesses or, or that's the teams that have the most success. And uh, sometimes it, it's, it's tough to, to figure some of that stuff out, but hopefully over time, with some events like this, you know, it's really making you really dig into the strategies of it and it'll hopefully help us in regular tournament play also. That's right. And and the and, only thing that I can say in this case was, um, you know, there's, I, I think there's a re really not a whole lot of doubt in my mind that this, this tournament had a lot more um, tough competition. I mean, it was really, really, People were commenting so much on how many matches. I know we lost a few of ours, 15-13, and, mm -hmm. and how easy that is when it's just such even good competition for that to happen. But yet you did have some large disparity between the highest numbers and the lowest number of players. And so, so the question comes in, in in drafting, and, you know, we talked about whether it was Snake and who – but um, is there a way to to balance some of these teams out even more than than what we saw? And um, I'm not sure. And that's a good but point. We're going to get into uh, our, our next part is going to be what we think if we could draw up the ideal MLP and we're just like anybody else. It's just our opinions. But what what improvements we could make? I want to wait, make one more comment about this tournament. We had a team where the four players were very similar in their ranking. So we didn't have like the 5-0 player, you know, and the 3-9 player and two in between. We played five matches and were involved in four Dream Breakers. And some went 19-17, 15-13. Now we only went one and four. We lost four matches and won one. But those dream breakers is what really makes it exciting just to be a part of it. Um, so, it, you know, even though we didn't fare very well, we were competitive and, and had a lot of fun. So moving on from there, and um, Jeff, you've played in two MLP tournaments. Vicky and I have played in two. Um, what, what do we think if we drew up our MLP tournament from our experience, what do we think would help kind of, neutralize or balance things out uh, and really maybe make a little few improvements on, on, on the format. Well, one, one thing that I, that I think they ought to really consider and do uh, as far as leveling the competition, because you, you want these teams to be as, as level as possible. I think you ought to take your team captains. Let's say we got 10 team captains and, Rank those players one through ten, 
have have some sort of committee there. We know most all of the players, you know, as far as us trying to do an MLP. Rank them one through ten, okay? Then you get the weakest captain picks first, okay? And then you go down to nine, eight, seven, all the way like that. Well, the best player is going to get tenth pick, but he's the best player, supposedly, at this MLP. And I think that's really important. I think some of these, Ken, have had a random draw. Um, I know this, the last one that I played in had that. If if you got a random draw and the best player in the tournament happens to pick first, right away you have a lopsided deal because he's exactly. fixing to pick, a, you know, probably the uh, you know the the next best player out of the next everybody else that's there. Um, if if I was like you said, this is just our opinion, but if I was ever running one, that's how I would want to. That's how I would want the draft to go. So that's one thing that I I would be interested in uh, making sure happen. Yeah, I mean, I, one of the struggles that I know that some of the captains come up against, and you know, I heard this from more than one captain, is that you're familiar with a certain number of players in this tournament. It seemed like there was a good number of players that people <clears throat> did not know. They, um, you know, my partner David, uh, one of my partners. He was um, fairly new at pickleball, and I think this was his very first tournament, not just his very first MLP. It was wow. his very first tournament, and he turned out to be a fabulous player, which was wonderful. But, um, again, who would have known him? Who would have known his level of play? He did sign on as a 4-0 player, but he's not because he's not played in any tournaments before. All he can do is self rank. He doesn't have a duper to go by. So again, you um, you know, there's a good number of players that these these you know uh, captains do not know. And um, one captain I heard say, "I wanted to go with who I know, who I knew." It it seemed riskier to him to pick somebody who he did not know how they played versus you know taking people at least he knew how they played so th that adds to the the whole element of you don't know what you're going to get <laughs> so. well so i think we've already talked about this on the other show but i was a captain in the first one that i played in and i did i did as much research as i could the night before <laughs> call try to find out about certain players and then when i got there that morning i i walked out and instead of warming up like everybody else was doing, I was trying to look at players playing and hitting the ball around and figure out, um, you know, who who I was going to pick. Actually, my first pick was, I'm pretty sure it was JP. Uh, that was the first time I'd ever met JP. Um, because you, you won't, what I've seen in these, you won't, you want those young legs and you want not necessarily a player that's that's um just good in doubles you want to get some singles some good singles players because Ken like you said um you're you're in four or five uh dream breakers so you better have a couple of a couple of decent um you know singles players and then most of the time a good singles players is is a pro is a pretty solid doubles player also but draft young in the second one I played in, um, I'll gig John Breen here now. Um, John Breen was a captain, and his first pick he picked B. And I said, John, they got they had all kind of young tennis players running around there, these really fast <laughs> athletes, and he picks he picks a guy that's older than dirt. <laughs> you made a mistake right off the bat, but John was probably going with familiarity. Um, mm -hmm which we had a pretty good team that day, like yeah. Ken, like y'all. We didn't – I think we went two and three or whatever we went. But, you know, we were we were competitive in, in, all our, in all our matches. I mean, and that's the joy of these is, is if, it, if it does work out and the levels are at least somewhat balanced and everything else, like I said, most of the matches were lost, you know, 15-13, 17, 15, I mean, they just seemed like a ton of tight matches. Um, 
and and that just makes it so much fun. It, it, it can get to the point where you don't care if you win or lose. It's just how how well you're playing and what the competition is like. So, Ken, was there anything else that stood out to y'all of, of things that you might would change if you ran an MO? Well, I, I think I think your comment, and I totally agree with it, is is having. Um, you know, just like the NFL, the, the the team with the worst record drafts first in the next year. I, I think that makes all the sense in, in the world that you give you give that basically the lowest ranked captain the chance to get the best remaining player that mm-hmm. was a non captain. I think that's that's gold. Um that's I yeah. think that should almost be a requirement. Almost to the point where I'm gonna ask that question before I sign up for a future MLP. Because you got the chance of the five zero player who's the best captain picking first, and then all of a sudden you've got you've got a heavy, one heavily weighted team. Um, you know, there was one other thing. I, I know people get excited and get involved um, in cheering ex- when a dream breaker is going on. You've got all the other team members around cheering, and they're even saying, "Get to the net, move back, drive down the line." You know. So you've got you almost got uh, immediate coaching in the middle of that, and that's kind of fun. I, um, one observation that that we saw was there there were some I'll say some close calls, but that where the ball that the player felt was clearly out, and 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 even other people felt it was out, but we had where the crowd got involved on a line call. And that happened more than once. And, um, you know, finally, some calmer heads, uh, I won't mention names, said, hey, it's the player's call. And had everybody kind of, let's let's disperse the crowd, the mob, put your burning torches down. It's the <laughs> player's call. And, and we knew the player, and that player is, is going to make the right call. Um, and I think most people will. So... Um, you know, I think that's one thing that if I had to make one, I would make announcements ahead of time saying, guys, make the call. Um, if you disagree with the call and you want to get, we'll bring a line judge in a referee in if it, if it seems to go on and on where you're suspecting it, but let's not get the crowd involved in line decisions. Yeah. to be honest with you, um, that's bad etiquette in rec play. For people mm-hmm. standing on the sidelines to, to yeah. say, hey, man, hey, no, that ball was – it's the players on the court. It's their decision. It's their decision. And I, I want to I encourage mm-hmm. people, one thing that you could do, and this, this could even happen like at the MLP you played in. If, if me and Ken are playing, we're opposite each other. You're sure it's out. I'm sure it's in. We can discuss that, and if we're both adamant about it, Hey, let's replay the point. Right, exactly. And beat your head against each other. If you're, if you're both, I mean, who's right there? You know, we we don't know. You know what I think, Jeff? Um, I think when you, this is new to people who've just been collecting tin medals and plastic medals, and you're introducing a financial aspect at the amateur Mm -hmm. level. It adds a little. Adds a little juice to the situation. It adds a little juice. It adds a little edginess. You know, Which is so good. that's a good thing for sure. Mm-hmm. It, it is. You should have clear cut rules on something like that, and that the crowd still, is not follow, able to do that. You still got to follow the rules of pickleball. I mean, right? That's right. 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 So, right. That's right. Any other observations, Vicky or Jeff, or things that that um, or even Bud? That if we had to design an MLP tournament, some things that w- that we might do. I just, I just think again, just like any tournament that we've been, you know, helping with or whatever that you learn, communication and how important it is for people to understand <clears throat> what it is their responsibilities are, where they're supposed to be, 
Are you playing on the same court the entire time? Are you moving to a different court? There was a, a little yeah. confusion with things like that. And so yeah. that can actually create a lot of delays and those delays add up, you know, if it's 15 <laughs> minutes here, 15 minutes there between matches, because you just don't know where you're going next. Well, that does not help out. So um, you know, whether it be signage, you know, charts, whatever it is, court monitors, however you think that you can keep things rolling, have everybody understand where they're supposed to be, uh, who they're playing next, that sort of thing. I think that's real important. Well, this is kind of along the same lines of what Vicky's saying, but I think if you're putting on one of these things, I don't think it's wise to play in and try to run a tournament. Um, yeah. If you're going to put on one of these for, for like Vicky said, to keep everything smooth, uh, it, it'd be hard for me to be out on the court and I, I need to get team A and B. I need to get them playing. They're sitting around. They don't really know what's going on. Well, I'm out on the court playing. I, I think if you put one of these on, you need to have yourself and a staff of three or four or five people to help you run the tournament. Everybody know what their role is uh, to make this, to make it, go smoother um and, and and i mean all of us have been in tournaments where they were very well run but they had a staff of people keeping mm -hmm. up with them. they had court that's monitoring. a great point that's yeah. a great point so and again you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's just our opinion but i i think everything that we're saying would help this uh tournament like this go a lot smoother well, and you know, some of the tournaments that I felt um, were well well run was where they really went over some morning announcements, and and one of the ones that I remember so clearly is the the tournament director says, "Guys, we're all friends here. This is pickleball. You know, treat it as though you're playing against your friends. Make your calls fair, mm -hmm. and 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 if it's close, it's in." And, um, you know, just reiterating that, that even though it's competition, hey, it's just pickleball and we're here to have a good time. So it's not, it's not, everybody likes to compete. It's not life or death, people. We're not winning. We're not pros trying to win right. thousands of dollars. And if you look bad, your sponsorship people are going, man, we got a, mm -hmm. we got a bad person representing our, we're, we're not in that position. So. Mm -hmm. You know, compete hard. Don't take it that don't take it that serious. Where you're just at odds with people and arguing over calls and all. There, there's just no place in my mind in the game for that. Mm -mm. I agree. Just kind of in recap, I think MLP format is exciting tournament, um, and it brings people of various levels within a range. You know, four zero and above or under four zero. So. You get to play with people you've never, maybe even never met before, but you're also rubbing elbows, partnering or playing as opponents to people that are a little bit better than you or not quite as good as you against a same sim similar uh, situation. So I think it just brings a new element in rather than playing right in your 3-5 level or your 4-0 level or whatever level you are. Um, against people that should be similar in your ability. So uh, I think it's an exciting format, and I, I hope to play. Vicky and I, I think we've talked about hoping to play in more of these MLPs um, going forward. Another thing for anybody watching this, these are just our comments. These are just our comments. If if you got a comment or something that you think, you know, uh, could, could do better or worse than one of these MLPs, put it down in the comments. All right, crew, that was a great discussion on MLP. And now we're going to introduce a new segment that we're going to start showing on our, our weekly podcast, and that's going to be the Coach's Minute. Jeff, Vicki, or Ken are going to talk about different things in pickleball, some drills, techniques, and things like that that they've, that they've come up with. All three of them are certified coaches. So they know a little bit about what they're talking about, and I think we're going to get a lot out of it. So our first Coach's Minute is going to be on dinking for beginners. Take a time out for a Coach's Minute. All right, today, y'all, we're going to start uh, some segments called the Coach's Minute on the podcast, and we're going to try to 
take you through some things, just giving little tips. Uh, sometimes it'll be beginner, sometimes it'll be intermediate, sometimes it'll be more advanced stuff, but we hope y'all will pick up on some of this stuff. So today we're gonna start talking about dinks. Um, the, the, the basis, your foundation for dinks. Uh, we see a lot of people that get real wristy, they get the elbow involved, but you wanna have what's called a pendulum swing. And what it is, it's, it's from the shoulder. It's from the shoulder with your forehand. It's from the shoulder with your backhand. And we're just kind of trying to make sure lift the ball up and over. Um, am I missing something there, Ken? All right. No, so no. let's let's go and ahead. It's, it's also just, you know, you want to you want to move with the ball too, um, so you're not reaching out. Right. You know, so if the ball comes to the the side, but you continue to use that pendulum swing as you move around and keep that ball in front of you, um, that way you're really learning one swing. You're not learning all different sides. All different swings. angles. You're repeating that same swing. That's a good point. All mm -hmm. right, so here it is. We're gonna, we're gonna both swing from our shoulder. Sometimes when I'm, when I'm coaching people, I'll get them to put their hand on their shoulder. It kind of reminds them to just go with the pendulum swing. We're going from our shoulder and lifting up and over. Me and Ken also, we don't want the net involved, y'all. We want to go up and over that net, up and over, trying to make it bounce into the kitchen with a pendulum swing, back and forth. Yeah, and it's it's almost like it's um, it's a catch and release, too. Yep. You're nice almost trying to, trying to catch the ball onto your paddle and lift it up over. Yep. And you can use your legs, too, to help you with it. Another thing is when we're up here, we want to stay relaxed once we get to the dink line. You don't want to be squeezing that paddle. It's the same thing when the ball comes to a backhand, that pendulum swing. All right, so there it is. Kind of some basics on, um, on dinking. Hope y'all get something out of that. All right, I hope you enjoyed that Coach's Minute. And now, as always, it's time for Jeff and his burr under my saddle. All right, I, I, I can't remember, um, we've only done like 342 episodes so far. We've done, what is, this is number 43, so uh, Burr's under my saddle, I'm really having to dig deep, but if I covered this one, I want to go back and cover it, because it's, it's really something that I'm seeing um, that, that people really need to focus on, and you can be a better pickleball player if you will focus on this and do this. People, when you return your serve, your focus needs to be getting to the non-volley zone line as often and as fast as you can, okay? And then within that point, if you get backed off of that line, rubber band back to it and hold the line as much as possible. Of course, we're going to leave the line if the ball gets popped up. But watch high-level pickleball, especially at the pro level. Those players realize the importance of getting all the way up on that line. And all four players normally are there. If they get knocked off, they're coming back. If you get bumped off the line and you don't come back up, it has a two-fold uh, damage to to your game one is when you back off the line and don't take up that space the other team has more room in front of you to make the ball bounce or to attack you at your feet that's the first thing the second thing is your angles when you're up on that line looking down at the court you're looking at a lot more court than what you have if you're backed off of that line and i'm telling y'all you'll hear a lot of coaches say this is an eternity. One foot is an eternity in pickleball in, in pickleball world. If you're back two feet hanging up, now now you're really you're really damaging yourself. So I want to encourage people share this with your friends. If you're sitting there watching, a lot of times we as coaches, a lot of times we're sitting there watching. Kind of, I mean, I do it at every rec play that I go to. I'm sitting there watching games and just seeing what the people are doing if they're in the right position. 
if you're sitting out and watching some of your friends play, remind them, hey, get up on that line. You know, during the point, tell them, squeeze, get up there, get up there tight. All right, that's a little long-winded burr under my saddle. Kind of revert back to uh, Howard Ward, who had the 30-minute burr under my saddle. But that's what I got this week. Uh, that's been on my mind here a lot lately. All right, Jeff, thanks for that burr under my saddle. Always intriguing. Hey, bud, I've got a shout-out. All righty, bud. I've got two today, um, and my first is for JP and his crew at Ace Point um, from the MLP in Hattiesburg. Just our hats off to you. Um, we had a lot of fun. It was a great uh, day, good competition. Um, it, you know, it drew a lot of great players, and like we said before, we even met new players we had never met before, and that's always uh, such a joy and um, more often than not you can turn around and say I have a new friend which is which is always really nice so it was a great day a lot of fun great job and my second one is to Rory Strengths of Pickleball Pick Apart who was our guest at Drills this morning and it was just a shout out to you for making your way to come and visit us it was a great morning it was very nice to have you uh, hopefully you'll make your way back to come and see us soon. Um, and, and we like what you do. And, uh, he also gave me a shirt today as a little thank you. So he actually has his own line of shirts. And so maybe we can give him a little plug or something on our, <laughs> on our, our podcast list underneath our comments or something. And you guys who are interested can give him, um, give him a little inquiry on that. So, but anyway, it was great to have you today. Um, tough morning of drills and everybody did really well. A lot of fun. And uh, back to you, bud. All right, Vicki, thanks for that shout out. And now it's time for Ken and his tournament previews. Hot off the press, it's time for Ken's tournament previews. Hey, thanks, bud. Let's start with April, April 6, 2024. It's the Miss Mississippi. It's a one-day mixed doubles only tournament at Halls Ferry Park in Vicksburg, Mississippi. Go to pickleballbrackets.com. Registration closes March 27th. Also, the same weekend, April 6th, this is at Pelican Park. It's the king and queen of the court. It's a round robin. Look, this is an interesting format. So you will sign up for your skill level and you will partner with, they could break you into groups, six or seven people in your group. So they could have multiple groups in the same skill level, maybe broken by age, but you will partner with everyone in your skill level, both as your, uh, uh, as your partner. So you'll take turns playing one game with each person as your partner as well as your opponent. So you'll play against everybody. Now you may not play against every combination, but you'll play against everyone in your group at some point as your opponent as well. Registration closes March 26th. This is also a tournament that's using the new Selkirk Pro S1 Pickleball. We're excited to play with that, more on that to come. Um, April 12th through 14th, this is the Hattiesburg Pickleball Classic at Tatum Park in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. Go to pickleballbrackets.com to register. Marlena Martis is the tournament director. Friday night is open play and a social. Saturday would be gender doubles. Sunday, mixed doubles. Uh, registration closes March 29th. There's almost 160 people registered we're looking forward. This should be a lot of fun. Uh, April 20th, 21st. This is the second annual Dinking in the Delta at Greenwood, Mississippi. Go to pickleballbrackets.com to register. Registration closes on April 14th for that tournament. April 27th. This is the fifth annual Eastern Shore Classic. It'll be held at Lot Park in Daphne, Alabama. Go to pickleballbrackets.com to register. It's a one-day mixed doubles tournament only. 
Uh, Lot Park, if you haven't played there, it's a great facility, 12 courts. Um, April 27th, 28th, there's the Vicksburg Open in Vicksburg, Mississippi. Go to pickleballbrackets.com. Registration closes April 21st for this tournament. April 28th, a one-day tournament is Pickleball for a Cause at Fritchie Park Gym in Slidell, Louisiana. <clears throat> We're going to put the registration up. Um, there's a phone number to call, or you can scan the QR code to register. It's gender doubles and mixed doubles. Moving to May, May 3rd through 5th, this is the club at the township in Ridgeland, Mississippi. Go to pickleballbrackets.com to register. Registration closes April 26th. There are already 77 people registered for that. The following weekend, May 11th, back at Pelican Park, it's the Heart and Soul Pickleball Tournament. Um, this is a fundraiser for No Heart Left Behind. It's a great organization. Go to Global pickleballnetwork.com to register, or excuse me, globalpickleball.network to register. This is a fundraiser again for the mission of No Heart Left Behind. It's men's doubles, women's doubles mixed, and there's going to be a junior scramble. Again, this tournament, we're using the Selkirk Pro S1 Pickleball. This is backed by a one-year no-crack guarantee. Um, we're looking forward to this tournament, looking forward to playing with the Selkirk Pro S1. The following weekend, May 18th, 19th, is the State Games of Mississippi at Halls Ferry Park in Vicksburg, Mississippi. Go to pickleballbrackets.com to register. The same weekend, May 19th, 18th and 19th, Dinking and Daphne. It's at the Daphne Tennis and Pickleball Complex in Daphne, Alabama. Go to pickleballbrackets.com to register. It's gender doubles on Saturday, mixed doubles on Sunday. We've had a tournament move its dates. This is the first annual Greywood Golf and Racquet Club in Lake Charles, Louisiana. The tournament's dates are now May 31st through June 2nd in Lake Charles, Louisiana. Um, there's 12 it's going to be 12 outdoor courts. They're using the Pro Pen 40 outdoor ball. Um, gender doubles, mixed doubles. Look, it's singles as well. There's already 81 people registered. A registration closes May 22nd. Again, that's the first annual Greywood Pickleball Tournament in Lake Charles, Louisiana. Going to August, August um, 8th through 11th. This is the second annual NOLA Pickle Fest at the Morio Convention Center in New Orleans. Go to pickleballbrackets.com to register. There's over 170 people registered. Going to September, September 6th through 8th, 2024. This is another brand new tournament. Very interesting. It's the Louisiana State Championship at the New Orleans, excuse me, Hilton, downtown New Orleans. Go to pickleballbrackets.com. So, Every state will have their championship games, and if you're a gold medalist in the state games, you get your uh, entry fee waived to play in the um, national championship. The inaugural United States championship will be in Dallas, Texas. So go to pickleballbrackets.com to register. Go into October. October 4th through 6th is the Louisiana Senior Games at the Legacy in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Again, this is a qualifying for nationals, which will be held in Des Moines, Iowa in the summer of 2025. Um, we do not have a URL just yet. As soon as we get it, we'll pass it along. And October 25th through 27th will be the Hollow Wheel Annual Fundraising Tournament in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Registration will open in April of 2024. Friday will be women's doubles, Saturday mixed doubles, and Sunday men's doubles. Um, that's it for tournament preview. Back to you, bud. Ken, thanks for those previews. And now, if nobody has anything else, I think it's time to say goodnight for this week's episode. Good night. Good night. See you on the court. Hey, from the Pickleball crew, thanks for watching, and we'll see you all next week.
Well, that's it for this episode. We hope you enjoyed it. Be sure to leave any comments and please like and subscribe to our channel. Thanks again and see you next week.